and welcome to season three of Travel Stories with Marsh. So if you love the world around you and you love exploring different landscapes, cultures, cuisines and cities, then you are in the right place because here every week we'll be talking to an incredible travel enthusiast who will take us on a fascinating journey around the world by sharing their travel stories. On the episode today, I'm joined by Farida Ahmed, who is the General Manager of Frying Pan Adventures, Dubai's pioneer in food and cultural tours. Now, a lot of culinary experts out there believe that the best way to explore and experience the culture and heritage of any place is by going on a food tour. With Frying Pan Adventures, Farida and her team have made it a mission to explore Dubai in all its uniqueness by going through the various cuisines of the world that exist here. Thereby, this is very far from the usual tourist trails that exist in other parts of the world. On the podcast today, I'm very excited to go on a food and culture tour around the world with Farida by listening to her travel stories. Welcome to the podcast, Farida. Thank you for having me, Marsh. I mean, there is so much that we have to talk about and I'm the timing of this podcast and this episode should can't be better because we are almost at lunchtime and we are going <laughs> to be talking about food. food. But first things first, now with Frying Pan Adventures, you know, you and your sister have kind of nailed it, you know. You. you experience, you help your, your guests experience the city of Dubai through its various flavors. Why did you think that food was such a unique concept to experience this city? You know, Marsh, food has this power to not just create, mm. but to cement memories. Mm. And this is how Arva and I grew up, being away from our home country. I mean, we were raised in Dubai. I think one of the challenges for my parents was how do we help our daughters feel rooted in India? Mm. And they essentially did that through the food that they served. Mm -hmm. And we just felt for people who live in Dubai, people visiting Dubai, this was one of the best ways for them to really achieve a deeper, more meaningful connection with the city. Yeah, and it is it is so unique, right? Because outside in the world, when you go and, and the way Dubai has been marketed, yes. people don't really see the part of Dubai that no. you show. You know, so, you know, what has been, I mean, you've do, been doing this for so many years now, since 2013, right? Yes. So for so many years now, you've do, been doing this. Of course, you know, you've you've had competitions along the way. There are so many other food tours and trails that have come along. But for you to exist as a company and as Prime Ban Adventures, what would you say is your USP? And also, you've always kind of, um, you know, stuck to a particular part of Dubai. Why do you think... Uh, this part of Dubai, in which I would want you to tell our listeners, <laughs> is so unique to kind of really experience Dubai. We grew up in old Dubai. Mm. We still live in old Dubai. Mm. My parents have been living in their apartment since 1989. Wow. We're still there. You know, my entire family, my, my maternal grandmom, uh, two of my mom's brothers. So it is home to us even more than the newer side of the city. Mm. And as you rightly mentioned, People who visit Dubai or people who live here are quite familiar mm. with the newer side, the mm. more glamorous side. You don't really need a tour guide mm. for that side of Dubai. Uh, when you look at the restaurants that are based over there as well, they are talked about, they are celebrated, they are written about mm. as well. But not these little corner cafeterias, little family-run restaurants. Nobody is celebrating them. Mm. Oftentimes, people don't even know about them, especially people who've recently moved to Dubai. So the idea was, let's take people to the places that we've grown up eating at or that we still enjoy eating at or that we've discovered as they've opened up in the neighborhood mm. to serve to people a very different side of Dubai. It may be humbler, mm. but that doesn't mean that it doesn't deliver on flavors. No, absolutely. And so well said, because they may be humbler. But the contribution of these, these, you know, small cafeterias and restaurants, I mean, yes. um, 
just to take one example, Ravi Restaurant, for example, is an icon of the it city, is. right? It is. Like that, I, I wouldn't know the names of so many other cafeterias Correct. and restaurants. You would. But these smaller places really have contributed to the growth of the city. And therefore, I think you think it is so important to highlight Absolutely. them and celebrate them in a way, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, of course, we are going to go on various <laughs> food and culture tours with you around the world. But now to begin, the very first uh, question of the podcast for you would be, where are you taking us on a journey today? All right. So I really thought about this. Mm -hmm. um, and if I have to nail it just one, I would say Thailand. Fabulous. Hands down. Hands okay. down. I visited earlier this year <clears throat> during the summer and I cannot wait to go back. Mm. I went there to eat. That was my focus more than even sightseeing. I mean, of course, you know, I did do sightseeing mm. and eat I did. And eat very well mm -hmm. I did, especially on those food tours. Okay. Uh, you know, Thai cuisine very often is just broken down to pad thai, mango sticky rice, mm -hmm. and the different kinds of curries. Right. When my food tour guide told me that there was no pad thai, that was going to be served on the food tour, I wanted to hug him. I wanted to understand what Thai cuisine is beyond it. Mm. And the insights that they shared, the tastings, uh, the, the markets that we went to, how to order like a local insider tips, these were invaluable. Mm -hmm. And it just made me feel really a part of the culinary landscape, a part of that city. You know, I did them in Bangkok and Chiang Mai, both places. It just helped me to better understand the people and the culture. So now, you know, going on this food tour in Thailand has been kind of an eye opener for you, but you're taking us on a journey. So take us on this culinary journey. All right. So I will describe the evening mm -hmm. food tour that I did in Bangkok. And let's say that there were over 15, maybe even over 18 tastings. Mm -hmm. And the highlight for me was that it started in Chinatown. And if you go to Bangkok and you miss Chinatown, you've missed a lot mm -hmm. when it comes to food. But also it's it's very overwhelming. Mm. You know, Bangkok as a city, mm. there are so many street side food stalls, uh, so many restaurants. How do you pick? Mm. I mean, chances are you're still going to have a good meal, but mm. then a great meal mm. is probably right next door waiting around the corner, mm. hence a food tour. Mm. Um, and the thing with Thailand, and I didn't realize this in Bangkok, is that Michelin is everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. Yeah. So we would inadvertently walk into a place and see, without planning and we'd see a Michelin sign. Mm. But there's something else that the locals trust more than Michelin. Oh. They don't really usually trust Michelin all that much. And that's when we learned about the green bowl. The green bowl. Literally, some of these street side restaurants okay. or stalls will have a picture of a green bowl. Oh. That is the local quality or the local stamp, rather, of a high quality dining establishment. That's fascinating. And if I had not gone on the tour, mm. I would not have learned that. Right. Hands down. Um I tasted things that I never thought I would have. Mm. Soy sauce, ice cream drizzled with soy sauce. Oh, my God. It blew my mind away. I, blew my mind away. I think we overdosed on rambutans and mangustine, but that wasn't the best part. I've been peeling rambutans the wrong way my entire life. Yeah. But they have this way where they sort of kind of twist it like you would a cap on a soda bottle and it just pops out beautifully. So then that just goes to drive home the point that, you know, when culinary experts, you know, including yourself, you would say that the best way to experience yes. a place is by going on a food yes. tour. I mean, that's that is actually so very true. Like yes. you just spoke about the green bowl, which yes. I didn't know when I visited Thailand a few times, you know, uh, and that is kind of the local stamp, which yes. says that this is a very authentic place to have your Thai food or local food. Yes. Uh, the different way, uh, the original perhaps way to peel the rambutan. I mean, these are things which are priceless, right? I mean, Absolutely. you wouldn't know about these things Absolutely. unless you go on a on a culinary yes. tour like this. And there's a whole story behind the green bowl, which I will 
not share because when you <laughs> go to Thailand, definitely book that okay. uh, food tour. Be- you know, it's, it's. So I'm going to just interrupt sure. you a little bit. So when you go, uh, I'm just going to digress very little, but not just uh, when you go on your trips yes. around the world, and yes. you, you definitely book uh, food tours. Yes. Do you have a mantra to book? a particular food tour, how do you choose these food tours? That's such a good question. And with Thailand, it was definitely not easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, My starting point for research is my travel contact list. Mm. Um, Or I will get suggestions from them. Mm. I will then check with friends, uh, with family, because these are your reliable, uh, credible sources absolutely and when it comes from a personal uh, source that's yes. why this podcast you know like you saying this i mean i just think that's uh, the travel stories from people when people are actually telling about a certain place or a food tour yes or a journey to any part of the world yes because it comes from a person it yes. just makes it so much more authentic absolutely you know you trust that absolutely that source so much more than you would a normal travel brochure absolutely. for example absolutely and again in thailand there's a plethora of choices mm. um so i go through the itinerary mm. and you know that it's a good company when they'll give you teasers they'll let you know a little bit of what is what you can expect mm. without revealing the whole movie in one go okay okay a lot of times you know how good or reliable a company can be by their customer service even before the tour Okay. How they respond so to your queries. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they are willing to part with insider tips even before you've booked the tour. Mm-hmm. And if they are, you know they're reliable. I know this because we do this. Oh, that's fabulous. So so for all the listeners who are listening right now, what would you say? Like the What would be your tip to book a particular food tour? In uh, If you're in Thailand and you're going to be in Bangkok... A chef store. Be careful when you Google because people who have paid for their company's ads will pop up under a chef store. But literally make sure the URL says a chef store. But what about any other part of the world? What would what should they be looking for if they're the want same? To book? The same things. When I was in Madrid and Lisbon, I went with Devour Tours. Again, I'd heard about them from someone, and then. So just kind of look out for customer service and if they're giving you a yes. little insider yes. tips and details. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Ease of booking, transparency mm-hmm. when it comes to the ticket price. Does it include all your food? Mm-hmm. What else does it include? Um, you know, little things that they do even before the tour has begun to ensure that your tour booking experience is seamless. Very often you're going to a new place. And you're clueless about it. I mean, you can do all your research, but having someone on the ground over there reassure you that you're making the right choice truly, truly helps. No, it's incredible. I mean, it's so incredible that how, you know, food and culture are intertwined and how much you get to know about a place just by its food. And if you're interested, you go deep into, you know, that particular cuisine and it just kind of, you know, opens up the box literally now. Now, staying on food tours, um, of course, you just mentioned about uh, the fabulous uh, food tour that you went to in Thailand. But which are your favorite food tours around the world? Which is probably the Ooh. most interesting food tour that you've been to so far? I would still stick with Thailand. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of learning and tasting, both, mm-hmm. it ranks really, really high. I I just learned so many new things, tasted so many new things. I would definitely stick with Thailand. You'd stick with I, Thailand? I would stick with Thailand. So for food tours, you think Thailand just offers so yes. much diversity? You know, Mosh, anywhere in Southeast Asia. I've done mm-hmm. it in Cambodia as well. Southeast Asia, doing a food tour there, you really can't go wrong. Mm. Okay. So Thailand, it is then the best food tour so far for yes. you. Yes. Now let's let's talk about uh, you know um, foodie destinations. Ooh. You know, I mean, of course, food tours is another thing, but then yes. there are so many places around the world that are known for their yes. food. But which, according to you, which part of the world, according to you, is the best place or the best destination for food? I'm going to say that I really think Dubai. 
I would definitely say that this is a foodie destination that people should have on their bucket list. Mm -hmm. uh, we have everything from, of course, international franchises. But more importantly, now the city is thrumming with homegrown concepts. Mm. People are doing amazing, you know, chefs, people are just doing amazing, amazing things over yeah. here. You can get everything from, you know, jollof rice, mm. all the way from Africa, uh, great food from the Indian subcontinent mm. as well. You have South African food. And let's not even begin with uh, Levantine food as well cuisine, yeah. and the one cuisine that you can for sure have in dubai that you cannot necessarily have in a lot of places around the world i don't want to say in all the places mm. uh you know is the indigenous emirati cuisine yeah like you travel to spain you'll have spanish food you come to dubai you'll still have spanish food Correct. you have you yeah. have that food yeah. available but if you really want to try something like emirati food for example you, you have to be it. here, yes. at least for now, yeah. until we can start exporting those homegrown concepts elsewhere. Yeah. So that is the one unique thing about Dubai as well. And I really think um, that is something that should be tried just to understand how people existed mm. and celebrated food at, you know, during times when it wasn't as plentiful as it is. Yeah today yeah so if you really want to understand the landscape of how dubai came to be it's really important to try the indigenous cuisine uh, as yeah. well no that's that's so true and you've highlighted this so beautifully i didn't think about it like that that if you want to experience emirati cuisine you really have to come to dubai or to the uae yes you know you cannot experience yes. that in any other part of the no. world you no. know, like the really authentic Emirati no. cuisine, you'll probably get Lebanese or Moroccan or, yes. you know, these other yes. cuisines, but you wouldn't find, no. you know, authentic Emirati cuisine if you don't come here. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's, that's, <laughs> I didn't think about it like that, but that is so true, actually. But now let's talk about travel bloopers. Oh, you know, like I always say, things happen when we travel. Absolutely. But let's talk about travel bloopers for you in terms of food. Has there been instances in your life, in your travel life? With food. Uh, with food <laughs> in any part of the world that you remember fondly or not so fondly? It wasn't really a blooper, I would say, on my part. But when I was in Armenia, I was a little bit surprised because Armenia is one of those countries that is all about bread, especially mm. lavash. Mm. Um, and I was a little disheartened because every place in Armenia where I where bread was served, lavash was served, it was not hot. Oh. It literally at times felt a little cool to the touch, not even room temperature. Mm. And in a lot of except in the capital city of Yerevan, where people do speak English. Elsewhere, where my partner and I drove around, it was extremely, uh, you know, w we were limited because of language. Mm. So we couldn't even communicate to them that can we... Mm. And, and we could see uh, lavash being freshly made, but somehow that fresh hot bread never made it. So for me, that was a blooper. Like, how can you, you know, yeah. the rule with bread is, especially if it's fresh, it should be hot. Yeah. And I think a lot of my meals were rendered a little less enjoyable because of that. Mm. Okay. Okay, no, that, that is, uh, you know, something to look out for. So anybody who's visiting Armenia will at least know that this is something to kind of pay attention to. So if you're ordering bread in Armenia, at least make sure. Or to carry your own coals with you <laughs> and heat it up table side. I don't know. I should have done that. <laughs> but would you go back to Armenia if Absolutely. you had to? You would. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Again, there is so much to explore in mm. Armenia. In my long experience with driving, Armenia gave me some of the most scenic yeah. Yeah. driving I have ever experienced. Mm. Uh, I was scared at times a bit because of the elevations. Mm. I, I do have a fear of heights. Uh, I would definitely go back because there are so many places in Armenia that we did not get to visit. Mm. We were just there for a week. So mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. Okay, fabulous. So now let's talk about hidden gems. I'm sure in your exploration of the world through, you know, food, there are hidden gems, places that people don't know yes. about, you know. So which is that one hidden gem that you would want to give it us, give okay. it away to us today? I'm going to keep it at Thailand, but this time let's head to Chiang Mai. Okay. And we just happened upon, uh, I want to call it a boutique because it had a boutique feel. It was gorgeous. 
and their flavor profiles just blew our minds away. And they use Thai cacao. Oh. It's organic, responsibly sourced to create these chocolates. So we're talking bean to bar. They had Thai bullet chili, mm-hmm. durian, which I love, cow sway. In chocolate form. Yes. And it con- and contains bits of crunchy caramelized onions. Masaman, oh my God. Masaman curry is also uh, there. And these are all chocolate fa- flavors you're talking about. These are chocolate flavors. And if you don't go to Chiang Mai, you don't have to worry. Uh, Bangkok Duty Free has the Amaya chocolates as well. Oh, that's fabulous. So this this place, is this boutique is called Siamaya. Yes. Located in Chiang Mai. Yes. So f- this is a fabulous hidden gem. And the kind of flavors yes. you're talking about, like masama and curry and... Khao sui. Khao sui. In I chocolate. Mean, in chocolate form. That's just... I mean, like we say, we'll travel for food. Now we'll, we'll travel, travel for, for chocolate to yes. Chiang Mai. Yes. You know, so you there is just so much, yes. you know, in, in Thailand. It's not, I mean, again, I didn't even know that cacao was a thing in Thailand. Yes. So, I mean, yes. right here on Travel Stories, we get to know this. I mean, this is incredible. <laughs> Love this hidden gem of yours, you know. Now, yeah. you know, coming to my next question, and I know um, you already, I mean, it's about responsible travel. Yes. And I know you already do so much about uh, for responsible travel because, you go to local places to eat. That's already supporting, you know, um, responsible travel in a way. So is there anything apart from supporting local restaurants, local chefs, is there anything else that you do for responsible travel? Um, absolutely. And, so, you know, sometimes it's about the little things. Mm. I will carry a plastic bag with me or a small trash bag in my mm. backpack when I travel. Mm. Because very often, not all countries... Mm. And I learned this in Thailand as well. Mm. Not all countries have public dustbins Mm. readily available. Mm. For me, responsible travel begins with little things. Do not litter. Uh, I'm extremely passionate about that. So I I will do that. Mm. Supporting local businesses, yes, as far as is possible, absolutely. Uh, I will tip generously as well. Mm. I also feel you have to know when to haggle. Mm. And there are certain bargains you should let go. Mm. So... You know, the, the concept is, of course, you're in a Southeast Asian market. Haggle, haggle, haggle. Mm. But I say these are people who really do come from economic backgrounds that are not as fortunate mm. as ours. Mm. So it's OK. You know, once in a while, you know, you might be getting a little ripped off, but you're not going to haggle in an Omega showroom. Mm. So maybe let those things slide. and you're not losing a lot by no, you're you know, not. giving and them I learned that this. much extra absolutely yeah. also I would say when it comes to nature a lot of uh, and again this happens in Thailand there are a lot of elephant sanctuaries mm. the word sanctuary is used to inspire comfort in you that you're doing the right thing mm. by visiting it make sure you do your research mm. because not necessary that anything that carries the name of an animal sanctuary is really that mm. there are certain Things like, you know, where they say, oh, yes, you can come and you can get close up with the elephants and and pet them. But traditionally, this is not something that elephants are comfortable with. Right. So maybe be a little bit more aware of the kind of activities that you book as well. So I will... So do your bit of research. Do your I mean, bit just of... With just anything, do your yeah. bit of research. Even if you're doing... I yes. mean, if you think you're, you know, traveling yes. responsibly, but that's... Yes. It's important to even... Do your yes. research even for Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Okay, now, you know, I know, coming back to food now, I know you're someone who will travel for food, yes. who does travel for yes. food. So if you were to tell our listeners that, you know, there are these parts of the world that are great for food, apart from Thailand, because we know that already, that Thailand is yes. great for food. So which are the areas of the world that you would recommend specifically for food to our oh listeners God. today? I am on a mission to really explore Southeast Asia. Uh I would say South Korea. Mm. I've fallen in love with uh, uh, Korean cuisine. It's only a pity that we don't have the chance to try North Korean, but definitely South Korea. Um, I think another great place, which I have not yet had uh, the good fortune to visit, but I'm hoping to change that, uh, places in South America. Mm. You know, usually when people think West, Mm. we're always focused on countries within Europe, which are great. Mm. I, I love I love a lot of the countries I've visited, don't get me wrong, or even North America, Mm. or at the most you'd get to Mexico. But I think South America, countries like Peru, Mm. Chile, uh, 
they have so much to offer us in terms of food and flavors um, and learning. These I would highly, highly recommend. Okay, now also for this year, we're almost, you know, slowly coming to the end of the year. But for 2024, which other places do you think that people must definitely visit? So this one is not so much for the food, yeah. but more for finding peace mm-hmm. and calm. Mm-hmm. Um, Uti in India. Oh, wow. I went with my family and it was just mind-bogglingly gorgeous, not even mind-blowing. We, we, we surpassed the mind-blowing uh, level. It was that beautiful. It was it, it was gorgeous. A drive up the mountain, you know, where we stayed, we stayed at a property by the Taj. Mm. There was a lot of history to it. I love that it was a pet friendly hotel. Um, and here's another thing. I had no clue. Uh, chocolate is a huge thing in Uti. Mm, I knew that. Yeah. I, I had no idea, but yeah. everyone was like, you must have. Uh, I still prefer the Siamaya chocolate, mm, mm. but it was still interesting. You know, we went up the mountain. You would never think that a place up in the mountains would be known for chocolates. Coffee, I knew, but not uh So, Uti, you would say, like, Definitely. really to experience yes. beauty like you've never known like, what I've, beauty I was. I have not. Uh, I, I have been to Kenya and I've experienced nature in that form. Mm. But, you know, the mountains, I, I can understand now why people say they're in love with yeah. mountains. Yeah. No, I have never been to Uti, but I've really heard... Beautiful stories. And now you are endorsing us as well. So Uti is on my list now. Amazing. But, um, you know, we've traveled around the world. We've gone on these various culinary journeys and so many exciting things that you've talked about today, revealed about this (laughs) fabulous chocolate shop in Chiang Mai. But what's next on your bucket list? As we wind up the podcast, what is it that you're looking forward to next in travel? Um, It's a toss up between Mm. Japan and South Korea. Mm. Wow, fantastic. And I wish you all the best. And I hope Thank you, you get to go to South Korea and Japan. Japan's fantastic. You will love it. Thank uh, you. South Korea is on my list as well. Amazing. So uh, I hope you get to do it sometime very, very soon. <laughs> and I wish you all the best. Thank and you. I look forward to going to one of your tours very, very Please soon. Please do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. I hope our conversations have fueled your wanderlust and inspired you to travel the world in new and exciting ways. Please don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and let us know what you thought of today's episode. Until the next time, safe travels and keep adventuring.